Hi guys, and welcome to another edition of The Week Ahead. We have a new participant uh, stepping in for the world famous Dominique, um, is our Italian friend, Antonio. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you, very well, thank you. <laughs> um, and then ironically, you and the Italian will be covering US, and Henry, good to see you, be focusing on UK Europe. Great to be back. Okay, awesome. So I guess as we always like to do, maybe let's start with the US. And Antonio, just the format we usually go with is uh, we kind of talk about uh, any Fed uh, comments over the past week, any key data points, and of, co and of course that mix with how the markets reacted and any surprises that you, you felt over the past week. And then we can kind of talk about the week ahead. And then we can, Henry will do the same thing for UK Europe. So yeah, last week uh, was, uh, so this week actually was quite remarkable because um, we had um, quite a nice inflation surprise, both on the headline and core. Actually, Sam, our uh, one of our quant uh, got again uh, a good uh, a good forecast. So he's doing very well on that. Um, so that I think it was the main event. Uh, then there was PPIs that they were um, a little bit in line, so not pushing uh, uh, too uh, uh, too far about core PC. So probably it's going to print around 0.3 core PC. That would be a good educated guess. It would round up to 0.3. But the main event was inflation. So remember that so far the Fed uh, was uh, more or less uh, all the members of the Fed were uh, on the story that the first two inflation print uh, were a bump in the road, that um, still there was no hurry to cut, uh, but clearly June was more, um, uh, you know, uh, a, a more elevated probability of a cut. Now with this inflation print, uh, obviously things have a little bit changed because it's the third print that is uh, uh, above uh, what the market was expecting. And uh, in this case, it's not really that uh, you have uh, maybe one or two components, but you have a, a different set of components that uh, are uh, warm. Uh, therefore, I think uh, that um, the market reaction maybe has been a little bit exaggerated in the sense that, of course, it's just one data print, but it's a data print that is summing up with other two data print. So even if the market reaction have been a little bit exaggerated, I think uh, it's not completely out of whack. Uh, because um, the inflation is proving to be uh, quite uh, quite sticky. Uh, you know, as you remember, we published a piece in December in which we were talking about this scenario, giving some good probability to you know to to happen. And uh, so inflation is not spiking, but is remaining at a level that is a little bit too elevated for the Fed. The market has reacted, and I think the reaction is more or less uh, in line with what you expect uh, in the moment in which the market was completely focused on a scenario in which uh, inflation would have slowed down and uh, the Fed would have cut more surely in June, now to a scenario in which clearly um, it's much more difficult for the Fed to cut in June and it's not going to happen. Okay, great. And if I kind of look at price action, just say like on the two-year, I mean, the real movement during the week was just it was basically Wednesday, like pretty quiet before that. I mean, obviously yields have been coming up for the past couple of weeks. Um, can you see a scenario where two year goes above 5% or you think more uh, if the growth and inflation numbers continue to stay pretty, pretty high, pretty strong, it'll more be feeding into the back end? So I think, yes, I see a scenario in which uh, it can go to uh, above 5%. Absolutely, yes, is the answer. Um, so in my view, inflation will remain uh, sticky. In particular, when I say sticky, I mean, it's not going to spike because we have not the same condition we had post-COVID, but still with financial condition that lose, and uh, for brevity, I don't go in the detail of all the different components of financial condition, but financial condition are loose. Therefore, to me, inflation is uh, something that will remain, when I look at core CPI, it will remain above 3% on a year over year basis. Of course, on a month over month basis, I don't expect always 0.4. I expect the number to come down a little bit, to be a little bit more volatile, to have even some low number, but still to remain at a level that remains a little bit uncomfortable for the Fed. The same is true for PC. Even if there is a huge wedge between uh, CPI and PC, 
The main reason is that uh, housing has a much higher weight on CPI than in PC. Uh, but still, I think even if we get a 0 0.29, 0 0.28, uh, 0 0.3, it's still, uh, let's say, around 10 basis point more elevated than the Fed would want to meet at the end of the year the target that they have in the set of economic projections. So I think uh, at best we could have two cut this year, could be less. So I wouldn't be surprised to see the two year going above five, probably not going too much above five because we still think that hikes are very unlikely. Uh, but uh, when I look at the pricing in Z4, in Z5, so in 2024, in 2025, um, they are, uh, of course, uh, uh, pricing now at a level that could become attractive uh, from the long side if you have the view that the Fed has to remain with elevated uh, Fed fund. And at some point, this will drive the economy into recession. And then, therefore, the short end could be in the future, not now, um, a very at a very attractive level uh, to go long, actually, when this will materialize uh, uh, and the economy will slow down, which is not for today. Right. Uh, okay. La last question on just current environment this past week. Uh, you know, some people are pointing to some cracks in the labor market, and I guess also, um, I guess kind of lower middle income or lower income. Uh, consumers starting to struggle with, um, with you know, paying back credit cards. You know, some questions on mortgages. Do you see either of those things becoming a a bigger issue in the next? Let's just give it like two months, or not really. And uh, not really, for the reason that we also wrote a piece in which we went into the detail of the weakness in the labor market, and there are a few spots of weaknesses. And I see a scenario in which, uh, um, you know, the Fed keeps the level of rate here, the long end goes up, financial condition tighten, and then it becomes more of a constraint for, uh, for the economy. So if you ask me, I think the, this episode will end up in a recession. I don't believe uh, we're going to soft land. I think we'll end up in a recession. Uh, in the next two months, I think it would be a little bit too early for that. Uh, and also because all the data that you mentioned on the consumer, uh, yes, it is all true, but it's still related to uh, a part of the consumer, uh, in, uh, which is not uh, very large. So what I say is that, what I mean is that at the end of the day, to get a meaningful systemic type of impact, I think uh, those numbers you mentioned are, and those factors you mentioned are not enough, but I feel and I think the episode will end up in a recession. That's the reason we are monitoring the short end because I think we will reach to a level in which will be very attractive position to go on because I think the economy will not soft land exactly because the inflation is sticky. The Fed is going to stay more, uh, cannot cut as they were planning to cut. They will start from next week, actually from probably today, actually from yesterday, Collins already said, Maybe monetary policy is not that restrictive. Maybe financial conditions are not that restrictive. And I think uh, you will start to see more and more Fed speak uh, to start to say that uh, we can be patient. Then maybe it's, you know, it's still three data point, but is uh, the bump uh, in the road story will be downplayed a little bit. On the top of that, you start to see a little bit of a shift, paying more attention to the inflation mandate that recently was not the case. Um, so that would be what I think. Okay, cool. Um, and then the the kind of week ahead. Yes. Yeah, so for uh, for the next week, uh, I think the most interesting thing to watch uh, will be what uh, uh, you know what the the member of the Fed are going to say. So next week, if I'm not wrong, we will see Logan, Daly, Jefferson, Messner, Bauman, Williams, and Bostic, and uh, they will comment. They cannot ignore this report. Even if a core PC is going to you know, be 0 0.27, 0 0.26, uh, whatever, I don't think they can ignore the report. And what uh, I, I expect, as I said, uh, them to adjust a little bit their narrative and to talk a little bit more the inflation mandate and to start to talk to the fact that uh, they can be patient, that uh, um, even if uh, the inflation has dropped a lot, which has been a great achievement on the Fed and so on. But we are looking at the data carefully because inflation has been more elevated than that uh, we would have thought. 
Uh, so I think the, the main focus will be on, uh, on, uh, on the speakers. And uh, <clears throat> I also think that they will, uh, yeah, we'll start to mention a little bit more the financial condition. Remember, so far they have said a lot financial condition and, uh, you know, monetary policy is restrictive and so on without mentioning too much uh, around financial condition. Maybe they will not be that explicit, but I think they will start to question if monetary policy is really that uh, restrictive. On the data side, uh, I more or less expect the data to be in line with consensus. So we will watch a lot the retail sales uh, with a lot of attention. I think a consensus is more or less right. Uh, we had some weakness uh, in the previous report, uh, but um, um, I think uh, the numbers in March that we will get on Monday will confirm that growth in the first quarter will print above 2%, which is my expectation. At the moment, the plant of Fed is at 2.4, 2.5. Between 2 and 2.5, I think uh, we can easily uh, land uh, around that, uh, that level. And then we have industrial production. And um, I think there will be a pickup here in line with the, um, uh, some pickup we saw in, uh, in surveys and um, even if in February, you know, industrial production, I think was, went up 0 0.1. I think in this case, uh, I would say 0 0.4, like the consensus of some upside risk to that. Um, then we have housing data uh, on housing. Um, again, I don't think the consensus is too far from reality. And I think, uh, uh, you know, the data um, will not uh, disappoint, uh, you know, uh, materially. Uh, I will watch very carefully jobless claim, but I still uh, expect jobless claim to remain uh, low uh, and not uh, to, uh, to spike. Of course, if we have a spike in jobless claim, it would be something to watch very carefully um, because it could signal, uh, you know, uh, is, a, is a high frequency data that we have that could signal some early sign. Clearly, it's not, uh, as Dominic said many times, the, the quality of the data is not always great. Then in case in which we have a spike, we will look at the single state data to check uh, what is going on there. Then we have some business survey. And um, I would expect uh, in line with consensus or a little bit better than consensus data for uh, the survey. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and I think it seems like everyone's keep, certainly from a risk standpoint, people are, keep getting concerned about kind of high inflation numbers out of the US, but we've seen to be able to, to handle that. It still feels like almost the market's more focused on kind of like your fear, although I think you, you're saying it's like six to nine months out, which is if we do have a hard landing, um, you know, what that looks like. So I guess, yeah, like you said, we'll, we'll look at those industrial production, retail sales, and obviously the, the jobless numbers. Yeah. So, so kind of Henry, moving over to, to UK, Europe. Um, yeah, kind of what's your take on the, certainly on, on the, um, any kind of ECB, Bank of England comments, uh, data, I guess for you now, it's also even like currency as we're kind of seeing FX markets kind of finally wake up. I know uh, Ben and the team put out the idea of kind of a bearish euro idea, bearish euro in general, but obviously certainly performing against the dollar, uh, sorry, very weak against the dollar that trades working well. Yep. So yeah, what's your kind of takes takeaways from this past week? No sure thing. So I mean, the main event really this week was the ECB. Um, I think uh, there wasn't much of a change in, in tone there from what I'd expected. Um, they're, they're very much still kind of setting it up for June. Um, it's interesting to hear they actually kind of talked a little bit about a few of them wanting to cut um, at this meeting. Um, I think at this stage, the, t the key things to I suppose separate is they're very clear that they're separate from the, the Fed. So Fed hawkishness is not going to be uh, driving them to be hawkish. If anything, my take would be they will be more dovish on the back of that. So if, say, the Fed was to pause in, in June, um, as is looking kind of increasingly likely, as Antonio said, and there was um, the ECB is going to base its policy on how much easing Eurozone needs. Um, and if the Fed is not easing, then that means that Ultimately, they're going to have to pull more of the weight um, because as sort of is known in rates markets, there's a lot of cross-market kind of influence. Um, so I think, yeah, the, the um, down in the euro, it makes perfect sense. Um, and I think bearishness in, euro, in Europe, certainly versus the US, it makes perfect sense. That being said, I think there are reasons to be cautious around fully pricing in a 
um, June cut. So for context, our kind of very long standing since last December view has been that they would first cut in June. And that was all around timing of data and how the ECB was setting it up. Um, so that's looking like it's going to be sort of valid, um, which is good. Um, but at the same time, until we get these kind of final pieces of the puzzle, um, I'd see value fading 100% pricing in, in cuts because there's so much volatility in some of the data. Uh, the March inflation print, for instance, was very strong in the services. And a lot of that was put down to Easter effects, but the national numbers don't really seem to be suggesting that. So we're getting the final reading next week. So we'll get all the information. And in that, I expect basically it will confirm that Easter effects of things like airfares being strong was actually not that powerful. And the sort of core services is still pretty strong. So that could drive a little bit of hawkishness. And then we have the wage data. So the Q1 wage data, which is uh, due end of May, that is going to be like the real sort of, I guess, kicker. And right now, all the sort of more timely stuff is suggesting that it's going to be quite um, in line with ECB expectations. It's going to allow that cut. But until we get that, it's very hard to be very, very certain. So I would be sort of, I, would, I suppose my two messages would be, they're not just going to follow the Fed, but at the same time, there are sort of reasons why I wouldn't be too confident of a sort of 100% pricing of a June cut just yet. Um, and we'll get more information, as I say, on, on that um, next week and probably quite a few bit, quite a few bits of uh, ECB speaker clarification as well. Um, on the Bank of England, I mean, next week's going to be very important um, in terms of data. We've got inflation and also we've got um, labor market data as well as retail sales, um, although that's probably slightly less important for the, for the Bank of England. I think the main thing that I'm looking at right now is the fact that we just, obviously the Fed hawkishness has driven a big shift in pricing across the board of central banks. Um, this is something we've kind of talked about previously around how the pricing for like sort of 12 months out particularly has been super correlated between the Fed and ECB, um, Bank of England, Rick's Bank, all of them, um, pretty much since last October and the Fed driving everything basically. So we expect that to, to sort of really diverge ahead. Um, we did get a, a, some messaging from Bank of England speaker, so the policymaker Green, Megan Green, she's quite um, hawkish and her speech was basically around how the UK outlook is much more inflationary than the US. That's something that we really, or I personally really disagree with. I think the the demand, the relative demand story is, is completely almost polar opposite um, in terms of, we just have to look at retail sales to see just how suppressed UK demand has been compared to the US. Um, and also in terms of the composition of service inflation. So service inflation is something that all the banks are sort of focused on. But if we look at sort of wage intensive service inflation, which is the kind of stuff that not rent, not communications, not these things that are kind of quite backward looking or actually driven by policy, they're really normalizing very fast. So there's been some volatility and that's what I expect to see in next week's numbers. So I expect to see accommodation prices in particular come down a bit um, and sort of again, some Easter effect, but not a huge amount. Um, so at this point, I mean, my, my, my feeling would be to be positioning for more hawkish on the Fed relative to the UK, um, which kind of aligns with Antonio's view, um, because right now there's about eight basis points difference priced in. Um, and I think probably at least the Bank of England will be able to cut 25 basis points more than the Fed this year. Um, so that's the sort of the main thing we're going to be watching next week. And then we do have the wage data and expect to see basically private over the next few months because single prints are always a bit volatile. Um, wage intensity, sorry, the um, private sector regular wages, um, the growth there kind of coming down faster than the NPR has been expected, been been sort of forecasting. And if we, if we, sorry, continue. Yeah, I was going to say for the UK, are you seeing, are you anticipating um inflation numbers to get near two and a half percent two percent is that what they're predicting is that yeah, just I mean, because of base effects like what why is that so different than the u.s so partly it's base effects partly it's the way uk energy prices work so they get okay. revised quarterly and we're gonna have a big drop um we're gonna have one in april and then a little one in july as well so by sort of the time that we get to the um the june meeting which is kind of where i see Bank of England as first being able to cut. Um, the May prints I've got, it will be about 1.5% year on year for uh, 
for headline inflation and yeah. core having a, a two handle at least even if it's a very high one so that's the kind of sort of environment it's partly base effects partly just um some of the kind of big shifts coming in um okay so that that, that would be pretty you know that seems like the market would take that as a pretty big divergence certainly from, from the u.s uh one question i had on yeah. europe is if we did see a move in the euro euro dollar below one, do you think that that would have an impact on whether they would cut in June or not? I mean, it's, it's a good question. I think below one would definitely get some concern. I think there's a couple of things that need to be borne in mind. Is one is why the U.S. is inflation sticking back up. I think if that if if the ECB can see any kind of parallels and see sort of things coming across that could happen in Europe or in the Eurozone. I think they'd definitely be quite happy to be more hawkish. Um, the issue is, though, that I mean, even on the inflation front, I'm sorry, an interest rate front, um, on a trade-weighted basis, the euro is actually doing quite well. Um, it's relatively strong, and partly that is to do with things like UK, um, partly it is to do with... Um, China, for example, the Chinese currency, there's about an equal amount of imports from US and China to the Eurozone. And CNY is obviously very weak right now, uh, kind of moving in the opposite direction. Uh, so it's about 10% of imports come from US. So there will be a inflationary impact if you had a new weaker currency, but it's not the be all and all end all. We could still end up with a relatively strong Euro trade weighted. I think the, the thing that makes it more important on the US side is that we get a lot of energy from the US and increasing amounts of LNG. And because oil prices already kind of spiked up, uh, and there's obviously concerns in the Middle East right now, there's always a risk that you end up getting a much stronger, a much higher energy price. And that yeah, will yeah. be, as we've seen, it kind of pro propagates quite, quite a lot through a lot of the economy. Um, so that will be something that they're concerned about. Yeah. But they would mean it's kind of one of those things that they say they really don't care about the FX forecast. Oh, sorry, the FX um, rate, and it's not going to drive the policy. And one of them came even out, even out, even came out saying like, "We're not the Swiss National Bank. Um, it would be actually be illegal to be sort of uh, running policy based on what the Fed's doing and things." Um, but whether they actually ended up doing that, if we drop below parity, that's unsure. But my feel is that I mean, it's, should they? big central bank be able to diverge policy by, I don't know, 50, 100 basis points and not have the currency absolutely crushed? I think probably. And if the the question is, I suppose, is the market going to focus more on the nominal rate differential or the real one? And of late, it feels like nominal has been pretty important. But as inflation kind of comes back towards less volatile, potentially real might become more important. And then that's probably going to make it much less of an impact on, on euro um, rate cuts. Awesome. All right. If you guys don't mind, uh, we don't normally do this, but can I put both of you on the spot with your, uh, each of you get your one favorite trade, I guess, and then out of 10, what, what's your confidence level? Maybe we'll start with you, Antonio. Okay. So short at 10 and 30 with, uh, more, so short 10 and 30 and uh, starting to build a little bit of an edge uh, going long uh, the short end, uh, two years slash uh, Z5. Okay, but so you definitely like... Steve. Yeah, but but less less weight on the short end, uh, more weight on the long end, even if the level of the long end is quite elevated. Let me just add one thing. Uh, why the, the little bit of an edge? Because we need to be humble on recession. We will never be able to time the recession because the date is updated later and so on. Who has uh, gray hair like me has seen the 2008 episode and so on. So even if the data looks nice in front of our screen, I think it's still nice. When it will turn, we will. It's very unlikely that we know in advance. What it is important to know is that is it possible for inflation to go to two percent if financial condition in general are so loose and net wealth is so elevated and so on and so forth. Then when you give an answer, if the answer is yes, then I think rates can go steadily low. But if you, the answer is no, rates will stay maybe elevated or go higher from here. And then we will go into a recession. The timing is very difficult to forecast. It's not, it's almost impossible. For us. Okay. I think that makes sense. J just for the record, 
These are from 1994. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not a lot. I don't know. The lighting. Uh, all right. And, and Henry, uh, thank you for that. And you're uh, feeling out of 10? Ah, okay. Uh, given the level, I would say seven at this point because the level is already level eight. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Henry, over to you on the spot. Yeah, sure thing. I mean, I suppose in terms of ones we've got out right now, I quite like the, or very much like the, the 210s UK steepener versus 210s US flattener. So for context, we entered that based on the fact that more dovishness in the UK is so very much on that line. Um, but the aim was to basically hedge the uh, the risk of US hawkishness, which it turned out to be quite sort of prudent, I guess. Um, reasons for that is just really, I mean, one, it's part of the, the, the relative central bank story. So seeing much more room for Bank of England uh, loosening than Fed, um, especially if we were to sort of look into post-November risk of sort of Trump, very sort of fiscally expansive, et cetera. Um, and the other side is in the near term on the supply side. So agree with Antonio on the risk of higher long end US rates and the supply story is definitely going to help that um, because they expect to be relatively strong in the US and also kind of see them winding down net bill issuance. Um, but at the same time, the UK, we're looking at sort of relatively strong issuance alongside continued active QT. And that means on a duration basis that it's it's probably even more sort of pain to sort of uh, see their comparative. So quite like the sort of relative steepener. Um, in terms of trades we don't have on, I would just, I mean, to be honest, I'd like to play these sort of, I'm sort of looking at pieces right now. I'm just looking at the Z4 Sonia's offer spread and just kind of looking for an increased amount to be priced in for UK um, uh, sort of loosening versus US. Um, in terms of my sort of conviction, um, unfortunately, UK rates has been horrible. Uh, so it's very hard to be super conf high conviction. But at the same time, I mean, I would say similar to Antonio, probably seven-ish sort of, um, especially given where it's kind of the movement it has sort of done since we sort of entered. And then it's kind of reversed quite a lot of that on the back of the US CPI, which seems sort of uh, erroneous. So <laughs> we'd look to fade that sort of movement uh -huh. to sort of return back in our favor. Okay, that's awesome. I mean, one thing I guess we didn't talk about, I guess you kind of touched on Henry, is this um, Europe does have a fairly high exposure to China. You know, there was a, all this talk about all these electric cars that are at the ports. And to me, I think one of the other things is 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 deflation being exported to from China to Europe. Um, you know, so so... I would say from, from my standpoint, I think that the trader though, you know, we're kind of bearish euro against kind of trade weighted index. Um, to me, I think that that against Europe and then uh, in general. So one, you obviously have US growth strong, inflation a bit higher than the US. I do think the higher oil prices, you know, will continue to be a benefit for, uh, for the US and a negative for Europe. Um, and I think, you know, the, the market has been, you know, can jump on this narrative. I mean, FX is built upon, you know, a diverging interest rate and growth, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, growth numbers from, you know, from different countries and different regions. And to me, I think this move in the euro may just be the beginning um, and may see, may see that move through one. I do think if we do see through one, like you said, they're going to come on and they may change policy somewhat um, unless the numbers are particularly on inflation are much lower. So for me, I probably would put that con conviction somewhere like seven and a half, maybe even eight, uh, probably better to use it through options. The vols are still so low and skew is particularly low. Um, okay. Then to move over just to any, any like highlighted pieces over the past week, as and tell you something we was kind of do uh, a here who's, who's, uh, helping us out and really trying to start to drive the LATAM focus for the company uh, with direction from Mirza. So he had a nice piece on Mexican elections and some great stuff again on China Watch. Ironically, as we were discussing, you know, deflation persists. Um, and then I think it is who's really exposed to that, um, who's most exposed to, inter you know, trade and, um, you know, engagement with China is, probably less the US and more Europe. Uh, obviously a review of CPI, some interesting stuff. To, uh, Henry, of course, your your stuff on um, the, the developed markets PCA model. Again, as we always stress, 
anyone focused on rates, especially RV people, we highly recommend checking that out. Um, some interesting stuff on upside risk to uh, treasury duration supply, all fitting into the, the narratives we've discussed. Um, yeah, and a whole bunch of interesting stuff. As we always like to say, we wish everyone, you know, the the this is being taped on Friday, UK time. Um, I'll just give my two cents, hoping for Scotty Scheffler to win the Masters um, and wishing everyone, uh, you know, an enjoyable weekend. Are there any parting words from you guys or? Uh, no, nothing special. No, no special plan for me, no. Uh, I'm on holiday next week, so... Uh... Yeah, <laughs> I'll be enjoying it. We have a lovely holiday. Well, I'll give the Dominique comment always, which is please, please, for, for all of our users, especially professional users, please send any um, any feedback. As she always asks, even negative feedback, things we can work on and improve on or you'd like us to engage with more. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck, everybody. Bye-bye.